Free Code Camp is the biggest online resource for learning to code. It has over 200,000 alumni, it has helped over 40,000 people get jobs as developers, and in 2021, they had over 2.1 billion minutes of instruction. All this can be traced back to the deadliest terrorist attack in the US and a 17-year-old dropping out of high school determined to find a meaning to life. This is the story of Free Code Camp. This story is centered around Quincy Larson. If you know him, then you already know that he is one of the most genuine and humble people out there. But not many people know about Quincy's dark past that led him to starting the biggest developer nonprofit and eventually having a huge impact on hundreds of thousands of lives. This story starts on April 19th, 1995. I remember like we were just sitting in science class and the beaker started shaking. And we're like, what's going on? Is it an earthquake? Come to find out, we turn on the news and like this major building downtown, which like half of it was missing. A domestic terrorist, a trader, had parked a big van filled with fertilizer and detonated it in front of this building and you know, killed I think, 168 people. I was like 13 years old. And, and just like seeing the images you saw of like babies being carried out of a, a nursery, it shook my understanding, like, okay, we're learning about the world being this way, but it, clearly it's more complicated than that. The blast destroyed nearly half of the building, collapsing its entire north wall. It also left a 16-block radius of destruction. At the moment, it was the deadliest attack on U.S. soil. Of the 168 people killed, 19 of them were children. This was the first moment in Quincy's life where questions about the meaning of life start to develop. Okay, what is the nature of this reality we're finding ourselves in that, you know, somebody can park a van filled with explosives in front of a federal building that has tons of security and just kill all these people? Like, like what would inspire somebody to do such a destructive, evil act? The search for meaning took him down quite a dark path. At age 17, he decided to run away from home and lived in his Ford Taurus that his grandma gifted to him as she passed away. I spent about a year just sleeping in my car, park at like a Walmart. This is 24 hours and it's pretty well lit. You could just sleep in, in your car and you know, the police would come and hassle me and I'd like park at like hospitals. I'd park at any place that was like 24 hours where I didn't think people would break into my car. During the day, I would just go to school. I was, I was still in high school. One day, at high school, I saw, you know, one of the leaders from my church. He had done everything right. He he'd gone to college and, you know, raised his family and everything. And he, but he was working. He had like a hairnet on and was working in the cafeteria. And I was like, like you've done everything right. Like, why are you here serving food, doing something that you know, somebody who dropped out of high school could have you know, conceivably done. Made me feel, at the time, it made me feel very disillusioned with education, so I dropped out of high school. And then I was just basically spending all day at the library. Although he wasn't in school anymore, this was a period of high learning during Quincy's life. I, I really do think that I was just learning how the world works. In school, you learn all this stuff about history and, and you know, civics and mathematics and things like that. And, and I think it's good for like a specific kind of vision of how the world works, but that vision of how the world works was constantly being challenged by what I was experiencing day to day. He eventually got a job at a grocery store stocking shelves at night, and one of his co-workers let him sleep on the floor in his studio apartment for $100 a month. After that, he got a job at Taco Bell, where his questions about meaning led him to getting his GED and to the next phase of his life. I was ready for more than that. I knew that like, I didn't want to end up like this old burly guy named Duke who had been working at Taco Bell for the last 15 years. It just, he just looked numb. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just like, I do not want to end up like that guy. Um, so I, I did go to school uh, because the school was so inexpensive and like I could I could basically work as a, as a journalist kind of uh, at the school newspaper and at some other local newspapers. And that's how I kind of further advanced my knowledge of how the world works. And I leveraged that to, to kind of like get in early on what was happening over in East Asia. And, and I figured out a way out of Oklahoma to go to a city called Tianjin in China and uh, do a graduate degree over there. 
During his time in Tianjin, he learned Mandarin through a very intensive program, met his wife, and had his first teaching experience. The entire time he was in Tianjin, he was teaching English, so by the time he moved back to the U.S., he already had about seven years of informal teaching experience. However, the problem was that he moved back to Oklahoma. Even though I had a grad degree, Oklahoma was just kind of like, there wasn't a lot of international work. And in fact, I went on Craigslist. I did a search for international. I just searched the term international, I think. And I was like, is there anything in this entire city, like this metropolitan area of a million people, Oklahoma City, that involves international anything? I think like the one thing that came up was uh, being a school director. So I like ironed my, my one suit and like, Basically did everything I could to, to prepare myself, learned everything about the company history, learned everything about all the different people I would be talking to. And then I applied for that job and they just did not think I could do it because I was just some you know 26 year old kid who didn't have a lot of teaching experience outside. Like I, I taught ESL, but I didn't have any like school management experience. And this was like basically becoming like the highest level person at this entire school. But the woman who interviewed me, she, she was like, maybe there's something with this guy. Maybe we could consider him. And then she sent me away and I, I thought, that's it. I'm not going to be able to get this job. And then uh, she called me back in for a second interview. And I was like, all right, thank goodness. Like, I'm, I'm finally going to get another a, a crack at this, right? And I went in and I interviewed like wild, like, like I'd never interviewed before. And then she sent me away again and it just didn't look like it was going to happen. And then finally she called me in for another two hour interview. And at the end of that, she's like, well, I think we can take a chance on you. And that was it. Like from that point on, I was a school director and I was able to start progressing in that career uh, in like educational management, like leading a team of like 25 teachers and administrators and running like a homestay program, running a dormitory, running like all this different stuff. It was so much responsibility all at once and all I did was sleep and then work and I did that for like two years to try to be good enough to justify the responsibility that I had been entrusted with. He progressed up the ladder as a school director and got to run schools in China and eventually transferred to California. Up until this point Quincy hasn't had any experience with code. He even self-admittedly said that he wasn't very good with technology or networking at this point of his life. This all changed when he noticed a really big problem with the way his schools worked. We had all this stuff that needed to be automated at the school. Like they didn't know it needed to be automated. I was like, this is absurd. Like I'm spending so much time inputting information into these forms. I think that that was a big revelation and that inspired me to really focus my energy on automating stuff. And I just started Googling and trying to find different ways that I could like I found this tool called auto hotkey, which I could use to basically program like mouse movement and program clicks and program like keystrokes. And then I learned like visual basic and how to like streamline and, and program Excel spreadsheets and things like that for the, the preparation of grade reports and attendance reports and, and, and even like the documents that I would give to my superiors to like be able to assess the health of the school and all that stuff. One person who was just like, a little bit curious about programming technology, we were able to revolutionize that school. We had tons of people transferring in from other schools because word was getting around like we had the, the coolest teachers who actually spent time with the students because they weren't, you know, doing great reports. And it, the burden of trying to like document everything can completely suck a lot of the, the, the joy out of teaching. I'm just very grateful that I had that opportunity to help streamline that. And with that, I was like, oh my gosh just a little bit of programming skills. Look at how much I was able to accomplish. Just some naive, you know, 30, 30 year old dude in a suit who didn't know very much about programming at all. Like once I did that, I was like, okay, like it's clear that there's something here. I should be spending all my time learning how to program, learning about technology. So I installed Linux, started learning SQL. I started learning Python, JavaScript. I started hanging out at this place called the Santa Barbara Hacker Space. I just coded, like my life depended on it. Like every day I'd wake up, 8 a.m., start coding, <laughs> grind through all day long, take, take occasional breaks to like just uh, go for runs and things like that. Even though he was a school director, which is a relatively high position, he saw the power that code can have. And he went all in on learning it for nine months until he got his first developer job. Every weekend I would go to a hackathon. I would just go all over California, wherever there was a hackathon, wherever there was a place where I could like go meet up with a team and build my network and 
and get some coding done and dozens of hackathons later and having won a few, <laughs> which I'm very proud of. One of the hackathons, I just sat down at a table and it was five people all from the same company. I didn't realize this. They just started asking me about programming technology and, and like, oh, what do you do? And I, because I was a school director, I was like, well, I'm in operations. <laughs> and they thought I meant like DevOps. So they're like, oh, we need somebody in operations. <laughs> So they got, so I got a, an interview with the CTO and about two hours into this long interview, we were like eating pho at a Vietnamese restaurant. And he kind of realized like, you're not, you're not a DevOps, are you? And I was like, no, I'm not a DevOps. But they, they took a chance on me and brought me on as a software engineer. So that was how I got my first job about nine months into uh, learning code. Lowest tier software engineer. I think they called me the build nanny because I'd like run get bisect and like figure out what happened, <laughs> whatever the build broke. Um, and I would just go, like I was tasked with like doing like some sort of upgrade from like Rails 2 to Rails 3, but they believed in me and they were really chill. And they accepted me as, you know, some 30 year old dude who had no academic background in programming or technology, had literally just learned doing MIT open courseware and reading books from the library and, and going to hackathons, right? Quincy finally found his way into the programming world, but there was still something missing. So I worked for about a year at that startup and your first developer job, you're going to learn way more than you learned prior to getting that, that job. Like ramping up to getting a job, that's really the first start step. And then the real learning starts when you're working with a team and you're just, you have a large legacy code base and you have the accountability of having to report things to your boss and all this stuff and get things done. And so I learned an immense amount during that first year, but I, I couldn't help but feel like yeah, I could, I could be comfortable here. Eventually, we will be able to afford a house in California, maybe. And I could potentially just, you know, trade up jobs and eventually maybe work at a big fan company. Get a job at Netflix, maybe. That's like, that was like, at the time, the pinnacle of the field. Like, if you got a job at Netflix, they were like super duper selective. So I was like, maybe I could do that. But then I thought like, you know, if I want to have an impact, I still want to teach people. And so let's just say I'm optimizing for being able to have an impact, really. Like a lot of people optimize for salary. I am of privilege. I grew up middle class and I've never really aspired to be more than middle class financially. I just, it doesn't matter to me. Like at some point I just don't really care to accumulate more money uh, once like my family's provided for. For me, it was just about impact. Like I went into education because I wanted to have an impact. The kind of problems I wanted to solve were not engineering problems, but like social problems. I realized I could have a way bigger impact if I was, not just managing people, but managing people and managing machines. And that's what programming is, is essentially managing a whole bunch of computers. I'm not a particularly smart person, but like a few synapses fired and I made this revelation like, hey, I can have a bigger impact if I learn to code. And then I, my initial goal was, I'm just gonna build a system that helps all school directors be able to automate their workflows. But then when I really thought about it, I was like, if I just teach more people how to program, Somebody else can build that and people can also build systems to solve food bank logistics. Quincy finally found his calling and a thing that he ends up dedicating the rest of his life trying to accomplish. From this point on, it's all about execution. I want to, I want to take what I've learned and share it. And even though I felt like I was still very much a beginner in terms of software development, I went out and I got a bunch of freelance gigs. I, I left Santa Barbara. I went and I had a friend. He was just a college friend and he let me sleep on his, on his uh, couch. And, and I just networked like a madman and I got involved in the startup ecosystem and was, it was trying to, uh, to, to create some sort of tech startup around education. But then at some point I realized, you know, like for-profit education, I don't know that that should be a thing. <laughs> so I was like, well, maybe we could do like, you know, I'm interested in open source. Let's do an open source project and we'll incorporate it as a nonprofit. And uh, the goal, I, I had several aborted projects that just didn't re, didn't go anywhere. I'd build like this tool that would be too complicated. I wouldn't be able to communicate it to people. And then ultimately, like I just started stripping things out of the projects and the projects became simpler and simpler and simpler. And the simplest project I ever built was Free Code Camp. It was over the course of a weekend. I, I just spent like several months building a project that nobody cared about and like nobody would ever return. We had like zero return sessions. How do we find an educational product that people care about and will actually use? We'll strip everything down. Instead of trying to teach all of programming or anything, let's just zero in on one 
skill that pretty much everybody should be learning circa 2014 and you know still 2020 but definitely in 20, 2014 that skill was javascript so we just tried to teach javascript and initially it was i was using some stanford's courses using some harvard's courses like like just basically taking a bunch of MOOCs creating this curriculum which is a list of courses um, and then I created a chat room and then I just would hang out in that chat room. I would live code on Twitch. So let's go ahead and tackle this one together. So first of all, what do we need to do? Well, there are some failing tests here. Um, and basically just try to get people to come and like hang out in the chat room community and like use it. And over time that did amass some people like, like people would come and I'd like, I'd talk to them and then maybe somebody else would come and I'd say, oh, you should totally talk to this person who's here. And then they'd start talking. And so we got kind of this critical mass just in the chat server, not unlike a lot of the communities that have propped up around Discord or Slack. And the, the magical thing was people were going through and completing the curriculum and helping one another. People eventually started getting jobs as developers. And then some of those people who were getting jobs as developers turned around and they said, hey, I want to help build out a better curriculum. They helped me actually get like the interactive courseware running smoothly to where we could teach JavaScript in the browser, HTML, CSS, and I wrote a lot of the initial lessons and I had help from other people in the community as well, writing these initial thousand lessons or so. Then we had an interactive like thing that was ours. It wasn't just like calling out to like existing Stanford database courses or Stanford algorithm courses or whatever, right? And then that just grew and grew and we, we created certifications. We started issuing those and then we had study groups all over the world, like launched the YouTube channel, which for the first four or five years, like it, we'd be like really thrilled if even a thousand people watched the video. But now it, I believe it's the biggest programming channel on YouTube, or at least the biggest channel that's focused exclusively on programming. The forum has grown. And then we have a publication which has more than 8,000 tutorials. I've written about 500 of them, and the rest of them have been written mostly by volunteers. And we do have an editorial team, and we do, we do now have authors who are basically just researching and writing art articles all the time. Like I said, we've got like 30 people. Almost all those people are teachers. So that is the story of Free Code Camp. It is now within the top 1,000 websites on the internet with over 1 million daily visits. It has the biggest YouTube channel within the programming niche, and they're helping hundreds of thousands of people change their lives through the power of code. But the story of Free Code Camp is not over yet. In fact, it may just be getting started. I mean, we'd love to create a free university degree that's a four-year bachelor's in computer science that's accredited. We're making steps toward doing this, uh, hopefully working with some existing universities, hopefully creating a university of our own that can be completely free. But if, if we can even get, you know, a significant chunk of like university coursework if people could do that on Free Code Camp and then transfer that in, then that is a massive win in terms of reducing the total cost associated with getting a degree. The big thing about college, like a lot of people will complain like, oh, I learned like Java and all this stuff that I don't actually use in my, or, or I spent all this time learning like liberal arts type stuff that is not useful for me as an engineer. They're just gen required generally credits. Like people complain about all that stuff. I think like that's not a big deal. <laughs> The big deal about university is it's prohibitively expensive. So that, that's our big goal is if we can dramatically reduce the cost of university, that's the first step. And then the ultimate step will be having a free option. I want to say a huge thank you to Quincy for taking the time and sharing his story with me. You probably noticed this video has a lot higher quality editing than my previous content. That's because I found the story truly inspirational and really tried my best to do it justice in this video. I honestly can't wait to see where Free Code Camp goes from here and wish Quincy and the rest of the team the very best.